Subscribe to Special Stories History Flix Chanel. There was a deafening silence in the operating room, only interrupted by the sounds of the machines and the clinking of instruments as the most complicated surgery was underway. The surgeon's voice was the only audible one, commanding the room with phrases like clamp, tampon, pressure dropping, we are losing him quickly, and two vials of adrenaline into the heart. After a couple of hours, the surgeon emerged, soaked to the skin and exhausted. Paul wiped the sweat from his face with his cap and quietly exhaled, phew. It seems like we pulled him from the other side of the world. If he survives the night, he will recover. The operating nurse, Anna, admired the surgeon and said, Oh, you did everything so masterfully and beautifully. No one else could have done it like you, Pavel. You are worth the price. Pavel shook his head and replied, No. I won't be going home to rest. I need to finish paperwork and there's a pile of papers that need attention. You can go home, Anna. Thank you for your work. It's easy for me with you. You do everything quickly and clearly, just as I like it. Goodbye. Blushing from the praise of the head surgeon, Anna rushed home, telling everyone she met on the way how Pavel had saved the patient's life. Everyone in the department valued and respected the surgeon for his exceptional surgical skills and easygoing nature. However, they were surprised by his reticence and tendency to keep his personal life private. For many years, Paul led the surgical department brilliantly, performing complex operations and taking responsibility for his patients' lives. He was also known for his honesty towards his staff, treating them well and praising them for their excellent work, while also scolding them for their mistakes. Despite his success, there were also envious people who tried to bribe or compromise him in order to take his place, but they never succeeded. The surgeon refused to take money as a matter of principle and practiced his profession with dedication and passion. His colleagues didn't fully realize how much he worked not only because he loved his profession, but also because he didn't want to go home to an empty apartment. This realization brought about feelings of sadness and nostalgia. After a long and difficult shift, Paul had hoped to get some sleep, but as soon as he had dinner and went to bed, he had a nightmare from his childhood. It was filled with his drunken and rage-filled stepmother, who hovered over him with a belt in her hand, while he, a little nine-year-old child, cried and begged her not to touch him. The surgeon woke up in a cold sweat and looked at his watch. It was half past two in the morning. He cursed and stumbled barefoot to the kitchen to make some strong tea, as he slowly scrolled through his unhappy childhood and life in general. Paul's own father had died when he was just a baby, and he didn't remember him at all. His mother had raised him alone, and when he was three years old, she got together with a man named Michael. Michael worked at a construction site and made good money, which improved their financial situation. However, he would periodically go on a bench, and he did not like Paul, treating him very coldly. When he drank, he even turned into an angry and aggressive animal. Paul well remembered Michael chasing him to the store for vodka, threatening to whip him with a belt if he refused, calling him a stranger's brat, and hitting him repeatedly. His mother, of course, tried to protect her son, but she suffered too. The woman worked as a nurse throughout her life and was a professional in her field. She helped the stepfather to quit drinking, but at home, little Paul often begged her to leave the tyrant of the house. Marina herself understood that this man was not the best option for a life together, but she almost made up her mind to take such a step. However, then she got pregnant and decided to keep the baby. The situation became more heated when the baby, Igor, was born, and the stepfather abused the stepson even more, considering him an outsider. Paul hated Michael so much and was so afraid of him that he was counting the days until his high school graduation to leave home and study. I must say that Paul's younger brother, Yegorka, on the contrary, loved and respected Michael and reached out to him. He always defended Paul when his stepfather was insane. The brothers got along great with each other and very rarely quarreled. Paul took care of Yegorka, 
protected him from older boys, and instilled in him normal human qualities such as love for others, compassion, and support. Most of all, the boy feared that his stepfather would raise his brother to be as cruel and callous as he was. Since childhood, Paul dreamed of becoming a doctor like his mother. He was fascinated with this profession and studied anatomy and other medical textbooks. After graduation, he announced that he would enter medical school, much to the joy of his mother and brother. Marina and the rest of the family were happy and supportive of Pavel's endeavors, wishing him luck. However, the stepfather was furious and yelled, causing the veins in his neck to swell. He said, Are you out of your mind? I guess I didn't whip you enough as a child. How the hell are we going to teach you there? Or have you decided to drink the last juices from me and my mother? Only rich people go there, not poor kids like us. What a lousy intellectual you are. Go to a vocational school. They teach real men there. Pavel was so hurt that tears came to his eyes. Jaeger immediately began to intercede for his brother. Daddy, why are you like this? I, too, am not going to a vocational school in the economy. We'll go when I graduate from school. I want to become a businessman. In your opinion, all a man can do is turn nuts and lay bricks. Mike Heil jumped on the spot. Look at him. He's in the same place, too. I've got you both in my sins, you wretched rascals. I'll kill you. Marina, it's your fault. You've spoiled them both. You know they defy their father. I support all of you. You are nothing without me. Do you understand? That's when Pavel couldn't stand it. Usually quiet and calm, he clenched his fists. And for the first time in his life, Pavel went after his stepfather. He answered him harshly, looking straight into his eyes. I hate you, understand? Just so you know, I do not need anything from you. I will make a name for myself, and I will take my brother with me. And don't you dare touch my mother. You've ruined her life already. I wish I could go away and never see you again. So they said goodbye, and Pavel went to enroll. He was very nervous and worried because the family had neither money nor connections. But to everyone's surprise, he passed the competition at once. As he passed his entrance examinations with flying colors, he chose surgery. He chose consciously. It seemed to him that here is the cutting edge of the battle for human life. Because to save lives is a good cause, and you have to admit that he was right. And his character disposed of the guy. He was assiduous, meticulous, and very responsible. All years Pavel was the best in his class. His teachers always held him up as an example. He wanted to prove to himself and to his invisible stepfather that he could. He would become a specialist and would achieve his vocation and respect by honest work. Pavel met his future wife, Svita, when she was in graduate school. She was also a medical worker, a nurse in a hospital. They perfectly understood the pros and cons of their difficult profession. They did not nag each other for frequent duty and tried to appreciate every minute. They began to live in the family dormitory and first took in Jaeger when he entered the university, looking after him. Pavel felt safer that way. In the end, his brother did not graduate, but he opened his own business. He had an entrepreneurial streak since childhood. At first, he worked odd jobs and speculated on trifles like everyone else, but then he started making plastic windows. In those days, it was a wonder for most people, and things went well for Jaeger. He bought himself a one-room apartment and helped Pavel pay the mortgage on his apartment. Svita, Pavel's wife, was just carrying their baby, and the pregnancy went perfectly. Delivery started on time, and Pavel quietly waited for the birth of his wife. However, time passed, and the doctors did not come out. Then began an incomprehensible bustle and rush, and a terrified Pavel ran into the delivery room. What he saw shocked him. Svita showed absolutely no signs of life. Her lips were blue, and her arms were hanging down in limp lashes. 
The surgeon personally tried to resuscitate her, and he fought for her life to the last. But all was in vain, the young woman's heart had stopped. It was as if he had become insane and refused to believe the terrible reality. He was dragged by force away from his wife's dead body, which he kept trying to resuscitate. As it turned out later, Svita had had heart problems since childhood, and it was absolutely impossible for her to become pregnant. But she was so eager to give birth to her child and become a mother that she concealed her diagnosis from her husband. She was well aware that Pavel would be against such a risk. So Paul was left a widower with a baby boy in his arms. It was probably just the care of the baby and the sea of work that kept him from going crazy. He simply forbade himself to despond, although he wanted to howl and climb the wall from homesickness for Svetlana. Son named Alexander, he kissed those chubby cheeks, looked into those huge gray eyes, and the tears rolled down his face. How much he looked like Svita. The boy had an interesting, conspicuous birthmark on his neck, like a heart. There was no mistaking it. Paul asked an elderly woman, Dashia, to come from the village. He had known her well since childhood, for she had partly babysat for him from time to time. The man could only trust his son to her, no one else. The old woman gladly agreed, and for a year, she tirelessly took care of the baby while Paul was on duty. But then she fell ill, and due to her advanced age, she was no longer able to run after Alexander as he began to take his first steps. Paul was understandably upset and began to look for a new nanny. However, in those days, there were no agencies to assist with hiring nannies, and they were usually hired on the advice of acquaintances or friends. Friends advised him to hire a young girl named Kenya, saying that she loved children, got along well with them, and would not disappoint him. Pavel liked her, she was calm, open, and smiling, and she got along well with Alexander. They started having fun and playing together right away, and everything seemed fine for a month. Nothing indicated that trouble was on the horizon. Suddenly, one day, Paul came home from work as usual, but no one was there. He thought that maybe Xenia and the baby had gone to the store and decided to wait a little. However, he soon discovered that many of Alexander's things and toys were missing. Paul sounded the alarm and called the police. They calmed the neighborhood and went to all the neighbors, but no one had seen anything. The woman seemed to have vanished along with the baby. Paul was tearing his hair out, drinking Corval, and rushing around the apartment like an animal in a cage. The next night, a brick rattled through the window and there was a note attached to it. It said the following, Do you want to see your son alive, Daddy? Then you must convince your brother Jaeger to sign over his firm to Crow. He knows who it is because he's very uncooperative. He says he's not afraid of anything. Maybe at least he'll feel sorry for his nephew. The deadline is a week. If you don't meet the deadline, you'll never see your son alive again. Don't look for us. We'll contact you ourselves and tell you where to pick up the boy. Paul was shaking like a fever and the first thing he did was to call Jaeger, for there were no secrets between the brothers. In a hoarse voice, he almost shouted, Come immediately, I beg you. They sent a note. Alexander is alive. My brother dropped everything and rushed over in ten minutes. He knew, of course, that Alexander had been kidnapped and was himself terribly worried about him. He sincerely wondered where and, most importantly, why this crazy nanny took the child. He even had thoughts that suddenly the woman could not have children, and she decided to take someone else's baby. She was crazy. What could it be? Paul handed him a note and pointed to the broken window. Jaeger read it all, clenched his fists, and muttered, Bastards. Bastards. Nothing is sacred. They couldn't scare me, so they're after my nephew. Crow, the local criminal mastermind, is in the raiding business. They've been harassing and intimidating me for three months now, and I do not agree in any way. You know why should I give them my company? This is my baby. 
I put so much effort and health into its development. Apparently, they sent the nanny to me. I told you she is too young for a nanny. This senior I did not like right away. Pasha, it's all my fault. It's because of my problems that Alexander was kidnapped. I'll sign everything tomorrow, let them choke on it, the bastards. The money is dust, we'll earn it, but Alexander's life is serious. We can't let anything happen to the baby. Paul sat on the floor and rocked from side to side with his arms around his head. He did not know what to do, so he said, Wait, where's the guarantee that after you sign the documents and give them the firm, they will return Alexander? It's a trap, I'm telling you. You can blackmail them endlessly, and I, too, the oaf of the king of heaven, even a passport from senior did not double-check, used to trust people, and now it turns out that it was not her at all but a stranger, and we know nothing at all about this hired girl. I suggest we tell the police about the note. We'll see what they advise us to do. I really want to save my son. He's the dearest thing I have, but I can't risk you, Jaeger. Let's do everything according to the law. The investigator listened carefully and read the note. After thinking for a long time, he proposed a special operation to catch the scoundrels. They would agree to sign a document at a designated location and set an ambush to catch the culprit. Then, they would interrogate him to find out where the child was being held. There was no other way out since the search activities of the operatives yielded no results. Unfortunately, traces of the nanny, Senior, could not be found. It was as if she never existed. As usual, everything went upside down at the last moment, and Raven smelled something suspicious and did not show up for the deal. Then rumors spread throughout the city that the scoundrel was killed in a showdown between the bandits. In the end, the company was left with Jaeger, and they could not find out where Alexander was. Since that ill-fated day, Paul has changed a lot. He became closed and began to live like an ascetic, working around the clock and doing nothing else. Still, at night, he dreams of his little son. He was humming, pulling his hands towards himself, and smiling with his toothless mouth. It was unbearable and led the surgeon almost to madness. Jaeger could not watch his brother suffer indifferently. He felt guilty that Alexander had been stolen because of him. After all, if it were not for his business, the baby would be alive and well. Moreover, by this time, he himself had married and had a son. One day, he suggested to Pavel, Why don't you want to take the child from the orphanage? I can see how you're suffering. You're so built that you need to take care of someone. Think about what I said, otherwise, your grief will swallow you whole. I'm worried about you, brother. And after a couple of years of waiting for some incredible miracle to find Alexander and bring him back, Paul finally gathered up the courage to go to the orphanage. He himself did not know what age and gender he wanted to take a child, he just decided to look at the kids, and then he would see. The surgeon did not choose Masha, rather, she chose him as a father. Serious beyond her years, the five-year-old girl boldly took the surgeon's hand and said, Don't be sad, uncle. Do you want me to draw you something? Come here, sit down next to me. When I'm in a bad mood and want to cry, I draw the sun and a cat. I really like cats. Why don't we draw a moose together? There's one that lives under our porch. She's funny and very tame. They met and never parted again. Paul went through seven circles of hell until he was allowed to adopt Maria because he was a widower, even though he had a crystal clear reputation. Then there was the dark story of his son's disappearance, but Maria ended up living with Paul. She didn't call him daddy right away, and at first, Paul didn't know how to approach the girl. It's safe to say that they first became friends, and a year later, they became the closest people in the world. Now, Paul was in a hurry to get home. He had homework to do, needed to feed the little girl, and have a heart-to-heart -heart talk. Time flew by, and now his little girl Maria was 19 years old. 
from a red-headed, inconspicuous, snub-nosed girl, she turned into a tall, statuesque beauty with a mop of beautiful golden hair with iridescence. She was still in medical school, but she had fallen in love very early. Vitalik was seven years older than her and worked as an ambulance driver. As a result, Maria was already living separately with Vitalik. Moreover, she was pregnant by him. Paul was shocked at first. How so? It's too early. She's still young. But then he remembered himself and felt reassured. He did not interfere and break the union of loving hearts. He would help the young family to nurse his grandchild. But now again, in the cold, empty apartment of the surgeon, began to torment long-forgotten nightmares. No matter how many years had passed, Paul could not forget either his stepfather or his son Alexander. He tried. Paul tried so many sedatives and went to psychologists, but to no avail. His brother Igor kept telling him that he had buried himself too early and that he needed to find a woman and start a family. Forty-five is not an old man, Paul only sighed. Svetlana still lived in his heart even if she had died, and there was nothing he could do about it. In his surroundings at work, there were many female colleagues, and some of them would not mind if the manager paid attention to them, but it was as if he did not notice the female sex. He communicated peacefully and amicably, but no more than that. Over the years, everyone got used to it and put up with this strange surgeon. Apparently, such was his fate. One morning, Paul got up absolutely devastated, as he had not slept half the night. The shift was also not easy, but most importantly, he could not understand why he had a constant feeling of anxiety inside, as if something bad was about to happen, although there were no objective reasons for that. Toward evening, when all the current examinations and surgeries were finished, the surgeon was sitting in the residence room drinking tea with Melissa, slowly coming to his senses. Suddenly, his phone rang, and the screen showed an unfamiliar number. But in the subway, Maria was crying and trying to explain something to him, confused. Daddy, I was robbed and beaten. I am running to you. I am almost at the hospital. Will you meet me? I asked a passerby for the phone, but all I remember is your number. God, I'm so scared. A frightened Pavel started babbling, wait. Are you okay? Are you hurt? I'm already running. Don't be afraid. I'm right here. Ten minutes later, he met his terrified daughter on the porch and took her to his place. The girl sobbed inconsolably, and he held her close to him and stroked her head like a little girl. The frightened nurses just looked at each other, not understanding what had happened. They immediately called the police and documented the beating. The girl said the following. Imagine, I was just walking from the supermarket. Vitalik was on shift out on the road. I decided to take a shortcut around the courtyard because, as you can see, the weather was bad. All of a sudden, these three guys jumped out of a back alley and came at me. I was stunned with shock at first. My legs didn't move, I froze, and that was it. They took my bag, ripped off my earrings, took my wedding ring by force, and I thought they were going to take my finger off. But that was not all. Then they pinned me to the wall and wanted to rape me. I was so scared, Daddy. I started screaming and screaming. I yelled that I was pregnant. I begged them not to touch me, but they just laughed angrily. Then one of them punched me in the face a few times, demanding that I keep quiet. Thank God some guy came running at that noise. They started fighting, and I dodged and ran to you as fast as I could. Paul was indignant. Those bastards, damn bastards. Well, nothing now. The police will come. Maybe on hot scents, we'll find villains. Come here, my little one. Does your stomach hurt? Is the baby all right? I'll give you some sedative drops soon. The police arrived, and Maria gave a statement describing the appearance of the robbers. The squad left for the same place to try to calm the area and find the bandits on hot footprints. 
They wanted to take Maria with them in case she identified someone, but Pavel explained that his daughter was pregnant and had been through so much. He persuaded the patrol officers not to do so. When the police left, Pavel called Vitalik. The frightened groom got off the phone and arrived immediately. He hugged Maria and began to comfort her. Then he tried to go and find the offenders of the bride to deal with them. Pavel barely talked him out of it, and they drove home together in a cab. Paul's shift was nearing its end when an ambulance and the same patrol car pulled up to the hospital with flashing lights. Did they really find him so fast? Wow, the doctor could only think. They were carrying a young boy on a gurney. He was unconscious and breathing heavily. His overalls were torn and there was a brown stain on the side of his shirt. All in all, you could tell by his appearance that he was probably a drifter and looked very untidy. An excited policeman reported to the surgeon, we caught one of the assailants in the act, but he can't testify yet. His accomplices stabbed him through the heart. Apparently, they didn't share the loot. You, sir, will have to operate on your daughter's abuser. That's the way it is, after all. It was the only chance to find out how it really was and about his friends, too. I would tell, Paul clenched his fists and gritted his teeth. His passions were boiling inside him. The man wanted not to operate but strangle right on the gurney this scoundrel who hurt his little girl. But the surgeon remembered in time that he had given the Hippocratic Oath and is obliged to help anyone, no matter friend or foe. The operation had almost begun, the patient was injected with anesthesia, and the anesthesiologist turned his head slightly sideways. Then, Paul saw the same mole on the neck of the bandit, a heart-shaped mole which belonged to his missing son Sashinka. There could be no mistake, he remembered it to the smallest detail because he had admired it many times when his son was little. The surgeon simply fell into a stupor because, in front of him, was his own native son who had survived and became a bandit who robbed his half-sister with beatings. All of this did not fit in his head. As if he heard the voice in the distance, the operating nurse said, Well, shall we begin? Pavel, can you hear me? Are you not feeling well? Maybe we should invite another surgeon on duty. The situation is extraordinary. We all understand, although Alexio will not have time to come. A lot of blood is lost. Paul shook his head, pulled himself together, exhaled, and answered quietly, I'm sorry. It's all right. I'm ready. Here we go. Scalpel. The operation lasted four hours, and the wound was just under the heart. It stopped twice, and the patient was on the verge of life and death. When all finally came out of the operating room, Paul began to give instructions to the nurse at the post. Lena, I'll sleep here tonight in the residence room on the couch, near this patient. According to the documents, it is Alexander. Pay special attention, he's very important to me. If he gets any worse, don't hesitate to wake me up. I'll be watching him myself. But I'm going to take a nap. I'm exhausted. The surgeon called his daughter and made sure she was okay. There was no pain, and Vitalik was nearby. The doctor drank tea and tried to lie down on the couch, then immediately fell into a heavy sleep. Overnight, the patient worsened several times, and only timely intervention by Paul saved his life. The staff whispered and wondered why he was so compassionate towards this bandit. After all, he almost killed his daughter. That's certainly a doctor from God if he can get over himself and save the life of such a villain. But in my opinion, this is too much. In the morning, the patient was feeling better, and the surgeon finally went home to take a shower and change clothes. When he arrived back at the department, there were already police officers and an elderly man waiting for him. The man looked unsightly, wrinkling his cap in his hands, and went up to the doctor, asking about his son, Alexander. Paul asked, Are you the patient's father? Then let's go to my office. We need to have a serious talk. And you, gentlemen of the police, shouldn't have come today. 
for at least three more days, he will be in intensive care. It is impossible to escape from there, and he will not be able to testify yet because he's unconscious. When they move him to a private room, I'll let you know, okay? The doctor led the man into the office and introduced himself, saying, My name is Pavel. Your son is still in serious condition. I can't hide it. The wound is too deep and very close to his heart. It's a miracle he survived it all, and that's why I asked you here. The thing is, twenty years ago, I had a tragedy in my life. My son disappeared without a trace. His name was Alexander, and he was a year and a half old. He was kidnapped by his nanny. The boy had a distinctive mark, a heart-shaped birthmark on the left side of his neck. You know what I mean, of course. We could take some tests, but I'm already a hundred percent sure that the boy I operated on yesterday was not yours but my own son. The visitor's eyes flickered and moistened, and he began to twirl his cap in his hands even more, but he remained silent. The little boy stretched out his arms to her smiling she took him in her arms. Kissed him fondled him and begged Ivan do not give Alexander anywhere I beg you. I have dreamed of children for so many years cried out all my tears cursed my disability and then such a gift from fate he was sent to us by God no less. Let's raise him as our own I'll make a deal with the village council I'll give. The money to whoever needs it will do the paperwork everything will be fine so. I felt sorry for my wife and I was sorry to give the boy away I knew that they would take him to an orphanage and what good would that do and so we began to raise Alexander don't think about it we loved and pampered him my wife couldn't get enough of him he studied well with straight A's but Alexander's temper was a real one stubborn as a bull if he thought about something he would never change his mind. Pavel couldn't stand it and said in his heart listen to you everything is fine and good and then how did it happen that Alexander became abandoned tell me how could it be he robbed and tried to rape his own half-sister my stepdaughter Maria last night he was caught by the police at the scene with a knife wound apparently they didn't share the loot and my daughters pregnant too do you have any idea what the poor girl went through she had miraculously escaped from the clutches of the villains Ivan waved his hands and began to cross himself this is all some mistake I swear Alexander could not he wouldn't hurt a fly when he was a kid he took all the dogs and cats home cured them and gave them a home we had a big fight though when he finished school he decided to go to the city to earn money he didn't like the village he thought it was Filthy no prospects for young people and I persuaded him to study to be a veterinarian and then you would work at our farm to cure the cows the salary is good the work is honorable no way he got mad shouting I don't give a damn about your farm. I don't want to work here all my life. I'll find a decent job in the capital and get back on my feet you'll see I said. My mother burst into tears and I got angry too. The old man slammed his fist on the table and said if your parents don't tell you what to do and you're so smart here's God for you and here's the door. Just so you know, I won't let you back in. You'll be in trouble in the capital. Who needs you there without any relatives to support you, you village idiot? And so, we said goodbye and gave him money. We spent all we had on the train and we haven't seen him since. He calls his mother once every three months, says he's fine and working, then hangs up. My wife is exhausted, crying all her tears. I understand that he's not telling the truth. He never came to me, he never told me where he was working, and he didn't invite me to visit him. Yesterday, the police called, saying that my son had been wounded and was suspected of a crime. Ludmila wanted to go with me, but I didn't let her. I think I will find out everything myself first. And there's no one to leave the farm to. Alexander may have done something. Foolishly, I don't know, but God forbid, I'll never believe it. Three days passed and Alexander finally regained consciousness. He was transferred from the intensive care unit to a regular room when the police rushed in and began to question him. Again, the surgeon did not have time to talk with his son. He only took Alexander's blood and gave his own. 
the result was expected, 100% kinship. No matter how much the police harassed the young man, he refused to admit guilt. On the contrary, he insisted that he was defending the girl and the attackers stabbed him and left him for dead. Go and find her and ask her yourself, Alexander said. I'm a vagrant, but I'm not a criminal. Don't hang all the dogs on me. I won't sign anything. Is that clear? I had to call Maria to the hospital and arrange a confrontation right in the room. There was no other way out. To everyone's surprise, Maria completely confirmed Alexander's words. She threw her arms around him as if he were her own. Thank you, she said. You saved my life, the only one who ran up to my screams from the back alley. You almost got yourself killed, but you saved me. My name is Maria. We never got to meet. I was wrong to run away. I probably should have called the police and an ambulance right away, but I was so scared. I ran as fast as I could to get away. Alexander blushed and said quietly, Come on, what's the big deal? Anybody would have done the same thing. Don't exaggerate. My name is Alexander. Do you remember them well? In the heat of the fight, all I could see was that one of them had a tattoo of a dragon on his arm, and I remember that one of them called the other one Raccoon. That's all. The cops took note of all the signs and went off to look for the real criminals without a break. So much time was wasted thinking that Alexander was the criminal, and now they were trying to find the bad guys. They probably sat down and went to the bottom to look for clues. At last, Paul decided to have a frank conversation with his son. He was glad that the boy was clean and not involved in the crime. He quietly entered the room and approached the patient's bed. Alexander was half lying down and trying to solve a crossword puzzle. The surgeon started first, Hello Alexander, how are you feeling? The guy smiled openly, and everything inside the doctor turned over. He now looked like him and answered, Good day, Paul. When I inhale, it still hurts a lot, but nothing unbearable. Thank you for saving my life, otherwise, I'd have been in heaven. The doctor sat on the edge of the bed, Alexander, I need to talk to you seriously. May I? The guy immediately waved his hands, if it's about your daughter Maria, it's not me. I told everyone a hundred times. I swear on everything. She confirmed it herself. I, on the contrary, heard the screams and ran to save her. So don't think I'm not a scumbag. I hate scum like that myself. The three of them attacked one defenseless girl. Paul smiled. I know everything. Do not worry. Maria told me everything. Thank you for coming to her rescue in time and even risking your life for her. That's not what I mean. I don't even know where to start. You see, 20 years ago, I also had a normal family. Only my wife, Svita, died in childbirth, and I began to raise my son on my own. The boy's name was Alexander, and he had a birthmark on his neck just like yours. I hired a nanny, a young girl, in order to have time to work and babysit the baby, and my brother Jaeger was a plastic window manufacturer so that my competitors couldn't get to him. So, they decided to steal my son to make my brother more compliant. I came home, no babysitter, no kid. Then, a lot of things happened, including gang warfare, police investigations, and searches. But my son was never found. I almost went crazy with grief, losing both my wife and my son at the same time. You wouldn't wish that on an enemy. Two years later, I adopted Maria from the orphanage, raised her, and loved her as my own. She was the one who helped me through the pain of loss. Honestly, I no longer hoped that I would ever find my son. I accepted the fact that he was probably killed back then. And then when they brought you in for surgery, and I saw that birthmark on your neck, you can't imagine what was going on with me. I knew you were my son, Alexander. Do you know that? That's why I fought for your life to the end. Your heart stopped twice during the operation, 
but I couldn't let you die, so I started it up again and again. I prayed to God to keep you alive and to make sure I was right. I took your blood and gave mine. Here are the results. See for yourself. Alexander opened his mouth, listening to all this. It was like watching a movie. Everything was so interesting and twisted. He reread the results a hundred times and was just in shock. His head was all mixed up. What about his parents? Where did they get it from? Then the boy asked dumbfoundedly, Wow, but I still don't understand. How did I end up in the country? Why did I grow up there? Paul continued, Your father told me that he found you in a field when he was working on a tractor. You had a note with your name on it, that's all. They didn't have any kids, so they didn't take you to an orphanage. They kept you, they loved you, and raised you. I think that when the criminal mastermind who planned the kidnapping was killed and the gang realized that the plan failed, they simply didn't need you. So they probably had the babysitter take you out, and she couldn't. She didn't dare to take the sin on her soul, so she took you far away in the fields and left you there. That's the way it is, Alexander. And now you tell me, how did it happen that you became a vagabond while your parents were alive and normal? You're a young lad, aren't you? How could you do that? Why did you sink? They're going crazy and worried, aren't they? The guy lowered his head, feeling terribly ashamed. You see, I couldn't stand life in the village since childhood. I just hated it. I felt that it wasn't my thing, it didn't belong to me. I helped my parents and we all worked hard from morning till night on the farm and vegetable garden, and it never ended. That's why I counted the days to finish school and leave. My father and mother dissuaded me, insisting that I should go to veterinary school. But I'm a fool, I'm as stubborn as a mule and I won't do it, although it's true that it's my vocation. I guess since childhood I've loved to handle animals, but I wanted to escape from all this. I dreamed that I would come to town, immediately find a job to my liking, and live like in the movies, coffee, jogging, work in the office, movies, and concerts. But it turned out that in real life, it wasn't like that at all. I tried my hand everywhere, but no one would hire me without work experience or education. I was hired to lay bricks on a construction site and they didn't pay me anything, so I started wandering. I couldn't take it anymore and thought about going back home. I was ashamed. What should I tell my parents? That I was a total loser and a failure? I have an abandoned house and I'm living there. I know it's not good and it's basically all my fault. It's my stupid temper. Only now, after your story, I understand why I was always so attracted to medicine. I really regret that I didn't listen to my father and didn't become a veterinarian. Tears came to Paul's eyes. How much that stubborn boy resembled me in my youth. I had slammed the door just as proudly and left my obnoxious stepfather. Alexander was just unlucky, that's all, the man said quietly. I understand. So many years have passed, and you consider Ivan and Lionel family, and that's normal. But let me give you a fatherly hug as well, son. I've waited so many years for this. They hugged each other, and both cried out of emotion. Sashka did not understand how he should live his life. Well, what about me? Where should I go now? I don't understand anything. Just my head is spinning, Paul said. Sternly, the man said, I don't force you to make a choice to leave your parents. It's stupid and nobody needs it. But I think you have to get wise. As soon as you are discharged, let's go to the veterinary academy. I will arrange it. You'll live with me, the apartment is empty anyway, and we'll visit your parents on weekends. You've already met your sister, and now you'll make friends with her fiancé, Vitalik. You're now a part of my family, and a very important part, and you're not worse than most people who don't have one father, and you have two. Isn't that nice? Alexander shook his father's hand and said, Thank you, Dad. I promise I'll study hard and I won't let you down. 
I'm really confused. Get my father, please. I need to apologize to him for everything and have a heart-to-heart -heart talk. You won't be offended, will you? The surgeon smiled. On the contrary, this is the act of a grown man. I'm glad he's coming, Ivan said, very worried on his way to his son's room. What would Alexander say when he found out he wasn't their relative? What if he was even more offended or angry that they hadn't told him the whole truth? Have they lost him forever? Bloodmolo would not survive, by God. Alexander looked at Ivan, so stumpy and a little absurd wearing boots and a work jacket. He also crumpled his cap with calloused, strained hands and did not know how to begin a conversation. The boy suddenly realized that he loved this man very much, and his mother too. In fact, they had given all their tenderness and affection for many years to the child, knowing that he was not their own. Not a word or a gesture gave it away. On the contrary, they were always sincerely worried and concerned about him. His mother cried and cried, and he behaved like a pig. The boy stood up and called his father closer. Daddy, forgive me, you fool. You were right about everything. I had to study, and no one was waiting for me in the capital, but I didn't listen to anyone. When I got burned, I was afraid to go home. I was ashamed to shame you. But to be honest, I missed you guys so much. Ivan was so moved and happy that he immediately grabbed his son in an embrace and hugged him tightly, fatherly. Then he wiped away a tear with his cap and said, What the hell, I'm good too. I got angry then. I told you too much. My mother and I were exhausted from worrying about you. We thought, what are you doing there? Where are you now? What are we going to do now? Pavel turned out to be your real father. That's how it is. Anyway, don't forget your mother and me. See us off. You are always welcome. Alexander seriously answered, Paul said that he would arrange it and he would enroll me in the veterinary academy to live with him too. He's right. It's time to get wise. Do you mind if I come to visit you and mom on weekends? I'll introduce you to Maria. It's crazy, dad. Just imagine that I unknowingly saved my half-sister from bandits. Ivan hurriedly replied, Pavel is absolutely right. I've been telling you and your mother the same thing. Go and study. You don't have to go back to the village. There are so many animal clinics in the city. I really want you to get out there and become a man, although your mother and I are simple country people and not trained in science. We love you very much in a human way, son, and wish you only good. The foster father and son hugged each other wholeheartedly. The man drove back to the village in a hurry to please his wife and tell her the important news. The police managed to locate the bandits by sketching them, and another episode helped. First, they found Maria's purse which the scoundrel had simply dumped in a nearby alley. A conscientious janitor took it to the police station, and the fingerprints of the ringleader nicknamed Syke were on it. The bandits settled down for a while, but the money raised from the sale of stolen gold and phones quickly ran out, and they went back to work. Since cases of attacks on women became more frequent, the police developed a whole scheme. Especially on a walk on the same evening route, they sent trained female employees under the guise of women rushing from work. That is how the rascals were caught. They tried to take the bag and remove the earrings from the employee, but she gave them a beating and called for help over the radio. Maria identified all three of them, and now the youths were facing a decent sentence. The girl was glad that they had been caught and would not be able to hurt anyone else. Alexander recovered and entered the veterinary academy at the first attempt. Paul put his son up at his place, for in fact, and rightfully so, it was his apartment too. The man dressed up his son and bought him everything he needed for studying. Now, in the evenings, they started to talk a lot and get to know each other better. It turned out that Alexander is left-handed, draws well, and also loves movies about war and fishing, just like Pavel. Father and son couldn't stop talking as they were interested in each other. 
However, they did not forget about their foster parents, and on their first day off, they decided to go to the countryside with the whole family. For Maria, who had never been there before, it was quite an adventure. Paul and Alexander bought many gifts, such as a warm shawl for Mother to keep her warm during winter evenings, and a device for the power tiller, which was also a very necessary thing. Maria baked a huge Napoleon pie, and they set off on their way. The villagers did not suspect anything. Lubasha was tilling the garden beds, and Ivan was trying to ride the stubborn mare in the meadow when Aunt Nina shouted to the whole village, Ludmila, Ivan, the whole delegation from the city has come to visit you with your son, and you do not hear anything in your garden. The old couple left everything and rushed to open the gate. Ludmila was taken aback when she saw so many guests, but most importantly, Alexander was running towards her with open arms. He was unrecognizable with his fashionable parted haircut, jeans, leather jacket, and expensive sneakers. He was quite a sight to behold, not just any guy. He hugged my mother and whispered in her ear, not embarrassed at all, Hi, Mommy, I missed you so much. Honestly, I want you to meet everybody. This is Mary, my half-sister. This is Vitalik, her fiancé. This is Paul, my own father and a wonderful surgeon who saved my life, and turning to everyone solemnly said, And this is Ludmila, my mother. She is the best. Ludmila blushed at such warm and sincere words from her son and rambled on, Oh dear guests, and why are we standing? Please, everyone, into the house. Ivan, rush to the cellar, bring bacon, pickles, and sausages, and call all the neighbors. We will celebrate. What a joy my son has come to visit, and not alone, with his family. An hour later, there was no room to spare. The table was overflowing with treats, and the physiotherapist, Uncle Stippen, was dashing about playing a melody on the accordion, and all the guests were singing along to the tune. Maria and Vitalik liked it so much. It was very hearty, simple, and sincere. The homemade cherry liquor was so delicious and gnarly that even Pavel got carried away, and he obviously had too much. He became friends with Ivan. They drank at the Brotherhood table and already agreed on the next time they will go fishing for catfish. In the end, no one went home that night. Maria and Vitalik decided to sleep in the hayloft. It was terrific. The smell of grass and hay just drove them crazy. There was such romance. The couple, of course, did not fall asleep until dawn the next day. They didn't say goodbye until lunchtime. For a long time in the morning, Paul could not understand what was wrong with him and where he was. His head was buzzing, his mouth was dry, and he fumbled with the bed looking for where he had put his glasses the night before. Ludmila came into the room and laughed. Good morning, my dove. Oh, you are not well, I see. I put away your glasses to be on the safe side. Go wash your face and drink some cloths with rye bread crumbs. It'll take away all the sickness. You're so tired from the habit, you've barely made it to bed. And my Ivan did not care. He and his neighbor were singing songs on the porch till morning. I could hardly get him out of bed. Pavel greedily drank fast and could only marvel at the sight of Ivan plowing the garden as if nothing had happened. What a hardening! He watched this simple, friendly, hospitable rural family and was madly grateful to them that they brought him exactly like that kind, sincere, sympathetic, and even if he made a mistake, that's okay. The most important thing is that he realized it in time and now his life will definitely get better. Alexander didn't fail and graduated from the academy with flying colors. Pavel did his best and was hired at a prestigious veterinary clinic in the city. You could see that this work brought the guy real satisfaction because he also saves the lives of pets, snatching them from the clutches of death. Recently, he brought an old, huge, fluffy Siberian cat named Bagel from work. Bagel probably got his name because he slept exclusively wrapped up in a ring and nothing else. Alexander was indignant, Daddy, can you imagine? 
The lady brought him to put him to sleep, this beauty. I asked why she wanted to get rid of a pet, and she said to me, I'm tired of him. He sheds too much hair, sleeps all the time, and is not interesting. My granddaughter asks for a puppy, and this is where to go. Anyway, he has already outlived his time. I even jumped, and my own hand did not have a chance to put Bagel to sleep. He seemed to understand everything. He did not break away or resist, but just doomed to look at me, and there were tears in his eyes. Do you mind if he stays with us, and then I'll try to put him in good hands? Paul nodded his head. Let him live, no need to put him anywhere. We have the most that can be good hands. He's been through enough. Very good cat, affectionate. Look how he caresses me. People like this lady and her granddaughter should be forbidden to have pets at all. This is not a toy played with and thrown away when bored. This is a living soul with its own characteristics. They also love and are offended and suffer. To hurt an animal is a great sin. Alexander hugged his father. I'm glad you don't mind. I feel so sorry for Bagel too. I hope that he will warm up at home. Maria gave birth to a healthy boy on time, and they named him Ruslan. Absolutely, all family members doted on the baby and took turns trying to cuddle him at least a little, so the young mother immediately went back to college and finished her studies, and her mother-in-law was taking care of the baby. Alexandra was invited to be Ruslan's godfather. It was a great joy and honor for the boy. Maria's best friend, Natalia, was chosen to be the godmother. At first, the couple just became friends, but the more often they all met together and played with the godson, went for walks, the warmer and closer their relationship became. Natalia immediately liked Alexander, a tall athletic guy and even a veterinarian. Alexander, on the other hand, perceived her only as a friend, a jolly fellow always ready to listen to her and support her. This red-haired, inconspicuous, overweight girl was not at all his type. But the more they got to know each other, the better Alexander got to know her. He liked the fact that she sincerely loved children and animals. On weekends, Natalia enthusiastically and with pleasure helped him take in the fluffy rejects, and once she even saved a puppy from under the wheels of a passing car, risking her life. And the boy began to admire her. He stopped noticing her weight and slowly fell in love, so that now he thought only about her. His intentions were very serious, and soon he invited the girl and her mother to his home for dinner. It was tonight that Alexander wanted to throw a surprise party and ask his bride to marry him. Pavel was very excited because it was, as you might say, a lookout. No matter how you looked at it, it was decided to invite Alexander's foster parents too so they would not be offended and could meet their son's bride. They did not forget Maria, Vitalik, and little Ruslan, and also Paul's brother Igor and his family. As a result, there were a lot of guests, and the table abounded with delicious smelling dishes. Everyone was waiting for Natasha and her mother to arrive, and when they crossed the threshold of the apartment, everyone just guessed. Pavel jumped up from his seat and embraced the woman as if she were a good acquaintance. He squeezed her and muttered, Katerina, can it be? How many years, how many winters, and you haven't changed at all? You're still as charming as ever. So Natalia is your daughter? Oh my goodness, we've known each other for a hundred years, and soon we will be relatives. I thought you lived in another city. We saw you and Svita off to your fiancé's train. I remember exactly, the woman whispered. That's a separate story. Sometime later, Natalia and I live together. That's how it is. What a meeting. I would have never recognized you, Pavel, on the street. Such a solid, respectable man. And Alexander, I can't believe he's been found. I remember that tragedy many years ago. Yes, God works in mysterious ways. It turned out that Katerina and Paul knew each other from their youth. The woman was Feta's best friend. Then she met her fiancé from the Euros and went to live with him, but in the end, it did not work out. 
The family broke up, and she and her daughter Natalia returned home five years later and lived together. The whole evening, the old friends were chatting away, remembering their carefree youth and rejoicing that thanks to their children, they met each other after so many years. When Alexander proposed to Natalia, everyone cried, especially the women. It was so touching, the girl was stunned, and she obviously did not expect it, so she also cried from surprise and hung on the neck of her groom. Everyone raised their glasses, congratulated each other, and there was an unimaginable noise and commotion. Only a cat, lazily asleep on the chair, sometimes opened his eyes and disapprovingly looked at the noisy family. He wrestled here, unable to sleep. Paul spent the whole evening looking at Katerina. For the first time in so many years of his life, a widower, she touched his hardened bachelor soul. The graceful twist of her neck, a lock of hair thrown carelessly behind the ear, a sweet, pleasant smile, and radiant blue eyes, all caused incomprehensible excitement and awe in his soul. Jaeger noticed this and whispered to him, Brother, is it possible that at your old age, you've decided to fall in love? You can't take your eyes off Katerina, you can't fool me. It's the first time I've ever seen such a thing. Way to go, Paul. Paul was embarrassed and even blushed, muttering, Don't make it up, just an old acquaintance and a very good woman. But then he looked at Katya again, smiled blissfully, raised a glass of cognac, and said, Jaeger, who knows? Maybe something will work out. What the hell, let's drink to that, and to Alexander and Natalia too. They'll make a good couple. Pavel was absolutely happy. His life was no longer full of heartache, suffering, and oppressive loneliness that was eating him up inside. Now he was the center of a large and close-knit family. His children and grandchildren were there, and they filled his life with emotion and gave him care and love.